I was bullshitting myself the whole time. And I wasn't, I was bullshitting myself because my bullshit story was, it doesn't matter how I feel as long as I care about my team and I care about the vision and I care about creating a product that people love. You know, I took this idea of servant leadership to mean martyr leadership, right? Like I was serving my team and every day I was helping hundreds of thousands of people. So like I was bullshitting myself that it didn't matter how I felt. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. All right. Well, welcome to the show, Natalie. We're so excited for your latest book to launch. Thank you. I'm excited to connect with you guys and talk about it and all things Awesome Human Project and more. Absolutely. And we started your book with a story that I think a lot of our audience can resonate with. And I, I'd love to hear a bit of your origin story. You, you start with the idea that struggle was your religion. And I know many in our audience feel like trying to become a top performer is an endless struggle. Yes, and that it's the, the way to be. Yes, absolutely. So I, um, just for background for everyone listening, I grew up in Russia. I came to the U.S. as a refugee when I was a teenager. So I'm a Russian Jew, which I feel like the official religion of all Russian Jews is struggle. I mean, have you ever met a happy Russian person? I hadn't. And more than that, you know, my mother is a pianist. My father is a scientist. And like, I just grew up with this idea that anything good has got to come out of struggle. Like my mom would tell me like, you know, the greatest composers, the greatest artists, like they are so good because they struggle. So I like took that all the way in. And then I get here as a refugee. That's a lot of struggle. I mean, I just want everyone to imagine. I'm 13 years old. I don't speak English. Whatever I do say comes out with a ridiculous accent. Everyone's making fun of me. I definitely don't look very cool. So I was like, oh, see, life, struggle. And so I really like it became like this thing I really believed in. And, you know, over the next 20 years, I worked really hard and I built a really successful career and I started companies. But I always struggled because I, I didn't think there was any other way. In fact, I thought that was the right way. You know, and I spent 20 years in technology startups, right? And it was just like saying like, the struggle is real, man. And so I was like, yeah, the struggle is real. And like, there was this worship of struggle. So I was like, oh my God, I'm really overachieving at struggle. Like I sleep four hours a night. I'm always like overwhelmed with self-doubt and exhaustion, but like I'm doing it the right way. So. I'm listening to myself talk and I'm like, this is an interesting story of someone who teaches emotional fitness for a living, but it's the truth. I never imagined I'd be here. And the way the origin story actually gets me to do what I do is uh, several years ago, I suffered a really, really debilitating burnout. In fact, I, I think it was more than a burnout. The best expression I've come up with is a breakdown of being. I just stopped being. I, it was the scariest thing I've ever been through. I couldn't function. I was a kind of a shadow of myself and it's really scary. I was, I was a CEO of a company called Happier, right? Helping hundreds of thousands of people live happier, but I could hardly function. I, I was blacking out. I hadn't, was, wasn't speaking to my husband of 20 years. I didn't know which end was up as a mom. And you know, it's all really hard to say, but I think it's really important to share. And as scary as it was in a way, it was a blessing because for the first time in my life, I stopped and I had to find a different way because the struggle religion wasn't working. And I did a ton of research and explored a lot of Eastern and traditions and just to figure out how to live and work in a different way. And eventually realized, hold on, these things I'm doing for myself, they can help a lot of people and here I am. Now that absolute shutdown is, I'm sure what a lot in our audience would love to avoid. What were some of the earlier signs of burnout in your life? So it's a great question and I just wanna be honest in saying there were many signs and I ignored them all. Like I, I don't wanna, like I had no, the skill, one of the core skills that I teach now is emotional awareness, and I had none. I mean, I lived from my neck up, you know, again, like the, the intelligentsia, like, you know, it doesn't matter what you feel, who cares? Like, I'm not even sure I knew a lot of words for feelings in, in Russian. So I had, there were many signs, but I never took them as signs because that was struggle and struggle was the right way. So some of the signs were 
I'm a really great speaker. I now speak for a living. It's something I really love to do. And I started to like not feel good in presentations to like investors or my team. I started to like forget what I was talking about. You'd think this would, you know, light bulb. But for me, it was like, wow, I'm struggling a lot. I must be doing it right. The biggest, I think, signs were, uh, the biggest one sign is just dread. I just began to dread everything. I opened my eyes in the morning after my, you know, maximum four hours of sleep because that's what, you know, super women do, right? Like if you're, you know, an entrepreneur, that's what you're supposed to do. But also I just couldn't sleep more than four hours with all the stuff going on. I'd open my eyes and I would just feel this heavy dread. And all I wanted was just to like not do the things, you know, and resenting your work is one of the top signs of burnout. Again, at the time I was like, wow, this just means I'm working a lot. Look how great I'm doing. Um, so that was a huge sign, just that feeling of dread of everything, including things I used to enjoy. But again, at the time, I didn't take it as a sign of burnout. I took it as a sign of fantastic struggle. I think this is an important thing to discuss as more and more people take on an entrepreneurial roles in their lives. The idea of a side hustle is becoming very popular now and so people are trying to get things moving on the side some of us have jumped right into entrepreneurship and we are going to rationalize a lot of our emotional uh, issues and mental physical issues that are going to come up from all of this struggle and we're going to rationalize it in one way or another in order to deal with it and keep plugging on now, is, is, is there anything that you can speak to of what those rationalizations look like and know when you're bullshitting yourself so that you can take care of yourself? Well, I'm so excited I get to say bullshit on the show. I, I should have asked. I usually ask because, you know, I do a ton of speaking and there's like no, you know, no word, no, no bad words on stage. So <laughs> this is uh, good. I love your question because that's what I was doing. I was bullshitting myself the whole time. And I wasn't, I was bullshitting myself because my bullshit story was, it doesn't matter how I feel as long as I care about my team and I care about the vision and I care about creating a product that people love. You know, I took this idea of servant leadership to mean martyr leadership, right? Like I was serving my team and every day I was helping hundreds of thousands of people. So like I was bullshitting myself that it didn't matter how I felt. And that's the biggest lie that we as entrepreneurs and as leaders tell ourselves that how we feel does not impact one our ability to actually make the right decisions you know when you're constantly exhausted and stressed out your brain starts to interpret that you're in danger we can handle as human beings short periods of stress we're actually very good at short-term stress if you're under chronic stress your brain says "Uh oh i am in danger and when your brain senses danger it goes into we all know this fight or flight well, you may not know about fight or flight. When you're in fight or flight, the brain says, okay, I only want to focus on the most important things that help me stay safe. So things that go out the door are analytical thinking, being able to consider multiple points of view, being able to consider alternative paths. These are all essential things for anyone having a side hustle or running a company. Like these are the most important things. When you are under chronic stress, your brain considers those luxury. It's a waste of resources. You know, it's really good when you're, what your brain does, it narrows your vision literally and figuratively like your field of narrow. Uh, your thighs get really strong because your brain is literally getting you ready to run. And so I say all this because this whole idea, like the biggest bullshit is, it doesn't matter how I feel. Like you said, I can just keep plugging through. Yeah, you can keep plugging through, but you can't do great work. You can't make good decisions and you definitely can't build a great business. And to me, this, this is the wake up call that I want to be, you know, and I speak to a ton of entrepreneurs. And when I started sharing my story, I can't tell you how many people came to me who were like with the quiet, the shh, like nobody knows, but I am where you were. So this idea that somehow our well-being our energy level is separate from what we can output it's just the biggest bullshit this is why to me you know one of the missions i'm on is you know that we have in this culture like this idea of like oh you're such a she's such a superwoman like oh he's a superhero being human is hard enough let's take off the cape because 
If we acknowledge that I'm a human being, I have a limited amount of emotional, mental, and physical energy every day. Everything I do needs energy. So if I am on empty, I actually can't do the things that I need to do. And for me, you know, I've happier and a few other companies I've run, I raise money for them, I hired a team, right? These are all things that entrepreneurs, we know are essential, right? You need capital, you need a team, you need product. Well, your energy level is that essential, right? It's like people tell me like, oh, I have 12 months of runway, you know, cash for my business. And I say, how much energy runway do you have? And they're like, what, who cares? That's actually more important. So it's a great question because that's the biggest lie that I told myself and that we tell ourselves is somehow we have unlimited energy to keep plugging away. We can keep plugging away, but no one builds a great business by plugging away. We drop great content each and every week and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. It's so true. And I was listening to another podcast you were on on my flight to Vegas last week. And what do they say when you're on the plane, right? Put your oxygen mask on first before you help anyone else. But often as entrepreneurs and leaders, we're not even thinking about our own oxygen. We're running around the plane trying to get everyone else masked and trying to get everyone else moving in the right direction. And usually it's the people closest to us who aren't involved in the venture, who aren't involved in the business, who see these signs, see us not sleeping, see us popping up in the middle of the night and feel the grumpiness, the lack of energy and emotion expressed in our relationships. And I know you talked about that in the book, how it had an impact in your marriage, in the way you were showing up for your kids. A huge impact. And again, this is something that's really painful to say, but I think it's really important to share. I lived under this like lie that it didn't matter how much darkness I felt or exhaustion or self-doubt, that it wasn't affecting anything. It was affecting everything, right? My husband and I have been together. We met in college. We're like a really old married couple, but it spilled into everything. And I'm not blaming myself. I, you know, I, I say this with a tremendous amount of compassion, but when I am on empty, I'm snappy. I have no patience. I expect only perfection. I know listeners are nodding right now because I know I'm not alone. I work with a lot of leaders, right? And it's normal. Like I, you don't have anything to give. You can't give what you don't have. And so I didn't have anything to give to, to my husband and it, our marriage suffered. I didn't have a lot to give to my daughter, not for lack of love, right? This is the thing I say to leaders and entrepreneurs. Like it doesn't matter how much you care about people in your life or people at work, or it actually doesn't matter. If, you're, if you don't have anything to give, you actually can give. So it had a huge impact on my close relationships, on my close relationships at work. And uh, you know, in retrospect, do I wish I caught some, you know, do I wish I had a moment of clarity at one point and been like, oh wait, hold on, this is impacting everything. I do, but you know, our brain loves inertia. This is one of the things I write so much about in my book of how we have to talk back to our brain I, I was in this inertia, as I said, like I thought that was the right way. Like I just assumed everyone did it that way. I didn't think there was a choice. Like my choice was I either succeed and I achieve a lot of things and I build a successful company and like I honor this American dream or I take care of myself and I take care of my well-being. And that was in my mind for lazy people. Like I saw well-being and success as a choice but it isn't. Well-being is a non-negotiable ingredient in success. So I just had it wrong. The book, define awesome human, because who doesn't want to be an awesome human? <laughs> no, it's a great point. You know, when we were working on the book, we had the content, like I knew what I wanted to write, but we didn't have the title. And then my publisher was watching videos of me speak. And for years I get on stage and I say, hello, awesome humans. And she was like, what do you mean by that? And I was like, well, I actually mean something really specific. I believe we all have an awesome human inside of ourselves. We all have this unique capacity to do something meaningful and good. Like, I don't know if you guys have heard of acorn theory, a lot of philosophers. I really believe in that. I believe we're each born with a destiny, a gift. And our life's work is to figure out what the heck that is and then work really hard to bring it out. That's the awesome part. But we're also human. That means we mess up and we can't do it perfectly. And it means we have to take care of our energy reservoir and we actually have to do work with our thoughts to kind of shift them to be more productive. 
So we're awesome and we're human. We're awesome humans.